Thank you. My great pleasure to introduce Luis Eduardo Luna, who is the director of the Wattawaska Research Institute in Florianopolis in Brazil, and an honorary research fellow at the University of Exeter. And it was such a fascinating work today. He's talking about the art of Pablo Amaringo. Thank yes, you, Luis Eduardo. Thank you very much. Okay, this is going to be quite a, a difference. No numbers, but a lot of images, you know. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, by the way, very impressed by, by the presentation, a lot of work behind. Okay, so um, so um, I did some uh, field work in the Bolivian Amazon in the 80s, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Pablo Maringo, who is a, a former vegetalista, who um, was also a painter, we created a school of painting, so we are going to, going to talk about the project from 1985 to 1994. So it's a, a re retrospective, you know. So Pucalpa here in, uh, by the Ucayale River, uh, this is an area um, um, where the, the, most of the population are mestizo, uh, several indigenous tribes uh, speaking 14 indigenous languages, but most of the population are you know, a mix of, of Indian, white, some black, uh, etc. You know. Culturally, they are uh, Amazonians. So this is the kind of people uh, uh, re, re, living in, in the in the in the river. And fishermen they work in. Uh, uh, some of them had been working in the rubber, uh, um, and of course, uh, in, in uh, this area has been um, quite deforested and under the influence of the oil um, companies and later on of the cocaine. So my work was on vegetalismo, and vegetalismo is. Um, um, it's a, a, um, I read it back. like the counterparts, the Indian shamans of many indigenous groups claim to derive healing skills and powers from certain plant teachers, often psychoactive, believed to have a madre or mother. <clears throat> so knowledge, in particular medicinal knowledge, comes from the plants themselves. <clears throat> the senior shaman only mediate the transmission of information protecting the novice from the attack of sorcerers or evil spirits and indicated to him the proper conditions under which tr transmission is possible. So the transmission is really, the, the all the shaman is not there uh, to teach anything, but just simply protect because the knowledge comes from the plants themselves. And I, I discovered that in uh, the concept of plant teachers. So this idea that uh, ayahuasca and many other plants are doctores, they are teachers that, you know, you, they, they have to be taken under proper conditions. And Don Emilio, my main teacher, told me, you know, the plants know each other. So we are within an animistic worldview. The main <coughs> uh, portion that they take, these people that I was working with, was ayahuasca. Uh, many of you know what ayahuasca is, which is a little bit different from yaje, which is another admixture plant. Instead of psychotropy, it is they use Diplopterus cabrerana, but both Diplopterus cabrerana and Sacotrevidis contain the dimethyltryptamine. You know, the psychoactive. And here, more or less, you, you see the area. Of course, the ayahuasca area is much larger than the Yaje area, which is um, restricted to Colombia and a little bit of Ecuador. Many indigenous tribes use a, 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 ayahuasca. When I did my doctoral dissertation ages ago, I, I came to 72 different indigenous tribes of many different linguistic families. But the main is the, the vine. That is the main, you know, because there is some uh, indigenous tribes, they use only the vine, you know, which contain no DMT, no visionary agent. Uh, but then um, they use these two that I mentioned, Cicotra and Diplopterus, but there are many other varieties you know, of, 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 uh, that you can add to the, to the vine. So here you have the plant in different stages of the development. So we are within an animistic worldview. Don Basilio, uh, uh, Don, Don Jose Coral, once we were preparing ayahuasca and looking at the bubbles, he said, you see, these are people. I, I do, wrote my doctoral dissertation about this phenomenon. And in 1905, I met Pablo Maringo in Pucallpa. Uh, he was doing, uh, he was teaching English, you know, uh, and uh, he's poor English, but still, you know, he was a, a tremendous pedagogue, but he was doing this kind of uh, landscapes, you know, uh, in cheap paper, cheap aquarellas. And, and, and later on, I found uh, some, uh, uh, there was a Swiss who made an exhibition, and uh, I recovered some of those paintings, and this is what he was doing. 
he was um, he was uh, ill for uh, for uh, uh, so heart condition, and then and then when he was in, in bed, he started to do painting. Uh, he 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 did it so well that he started to fake money, you know, paint money one by one, and was and people are <laughs> were getting, and he was in jail many times. And he so he was uh, escaping. The justice went to the Chipewa Indians, learned about their work, uh, a living, and so on. So, so really quite an adventure. <clears throat> so, it w this is one of the paintings that that I uh, that I got. And and here you you see the uh, an ayahuasquero, uh, you know, a vegetalista blowing tobacco. Uh, but this I found much later. The thing is that I noticed that he has this fantastic memory, eidetic memory. He could remember anything he said. And I asked him, do you remember the visions you had when you were having uh, <laughs> taking ayahuasca? He said that he had not taken an ayahuasca for seven years. He had a big uh, fight with another shaman and, uh, and so on. So, um, but anyway, he presented uh, uh, me this, uh, this painting and Dennis McKenna was with me, another one. This is the what Dennis got. I went to Helsinki, took a photocopy of this painting, and I sent him a, a message. I'm sending here a photocopy of the Yavaska visionary painting you gave me. I'm very curious to know the meaning of certain figures. Could you be possible to send me back one of the photocopies with commentaries? For example, writing who is who, what certain objects represent. I'm also curious to know about figures in the, in, in the painting of Dennis. He came a long letter. Impossible to go through, but here there are, you know, he gave me, you know, the, the seven uh, uh, um, uh, figures that I wanted to have an explanation, you know, a whole explanation. And I was absolutely amazed because I've been working with uh, 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 vegetalistas and they tell you stories about this and that, but it's completely different to be able to see, you know, what a shaman or former shaman was seen. And, and what he was saying, they were not only about, you know, jungle, spirits and all that, but there were cities, people from China, from this and that, and flying saucers. I mean, it was a, 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 an iconography that I never imagined that was in the head of some humble Amazonian guy. Inspired by Rachel Domatov, who, um, whom I met at some point, um, who wrote Amazonian Cosmos, and he wrote, the, uh, he was with only one informant. And then he wrote this book, Beyond the Milky Way, he took paper to the Barasana Indians and asked them to paint whatever they wanted. And what they painted was the visionary world. So I thought I'm going to do the same thing in, in the Siona, for instance, all the body painting and the narrations and uh, about the Siona is all about the visionary world. So this is one of the uh, uh, Siona paintings uh, um, uh, collected by Jean Landon, who has been working with them. And this, so this is a, a third painting that he made. Um, so suddenly, you know, I, I found this is a, this is a gold mine, you know, to, to, to try to understand the vegetalista tradition that had been studied only with informants, but with a painter. So this idea of the plant, the, the, the plant teachers and the mother of plants came out, uh, uh, which was absolutely fascinating. You know, to, and, and then look at the iconography, big cities, you know, and people from many cultures appearing, um, uh, princes, princesses, all that, you know, so I, I was completely bewildered by, by this kind of and, and strange machines and so on. So uh, he said, well, that's what I have been seeing. And I wanted to ask him about particular things, you know, in the Amazon, the, many of the shaman, they say that they, they have something called yachai, which is a flame. A physical flame, I've seen it, they have it, you know, and they say that the witches, they put some darts in the flame and they are able to keep it there and they are able to send it. So I, I was asking, and he was explaining to me what, you know, what this is, what is the flame itself, you know, and here you have the, the flame as he understands it. And, and so, and so with, you know, things coming out, uh, you know, with, with long tongues and the, the tongue, out, uh, is a very typical uh, iconographical motif in many different South American cultures. You know, I didn't put any examples here, so it was possibly. <clears throat> so, so here we have the Renaco, a, 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 a Renaco tree, and this is the, the, the depiction of the Renaco on the defects of ayahuasca, in which you see all this. You know, so I just show some some of it because I will. Uh, 
Well, I could speak 10 minutes each slide here. Perhaps one going to say in the Amazon, there is this idea that there is a big serpent, the, the, the Yakumama, that becomes a boat or the snake canoe, uh, different tribes, they have different names. But it's the snake canoe, the Tucano, they say canoe, but it's a serpent and the, the Tucano went inside and hit the rock and came out. And so there are stories, you know, about, about the, 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 the Yakumama. Uh, but, but then I realized in this painting, you know, the white mama, there is the serpent of the air, and then it does become a boat. It becomes a, a flying saucer. So, <clears throat> and Pablo told me this is a representation of what, how he was healed. He had this uh, the, the heart uh, um, condition, and on the ayahuasca, then he, an American doctor came with nurses. And, and operated him and he was healed. And then you see the, the flying sauce there behind, you know? And uh, um, so here a, a detail. So he continued doing landscape. I, I, I provided with very good paper and pencil and everything. So he continued doing beautiful landscapes. So here are some examples of them. But then, of course, you know, really a tremendous knowledge of, of the forest. I mean, here you have the people taking a patch of the biggest uh, uh, fresh uh, uh, fish in, in the Amazon, in the world, you know, taking it out. So detailed knowledge of the data being um, uh, prepared and so on. And here, here the, the a, a, a shaman, you know, with his pipe, you know, I just noticed preparing this talk, I noticed the little figure and I, Never seen it before. And then uh, in 1991, we published um, Ayahuasca Visions with 49, uh, 45 paintings, a big introduction. I wrote um, I wrote a series of footnotes relating some of the motifs in, within um, Amazonian and Inca traditions and um, um, finding the, uh, the scientific identification of the plants and the animals. And there was a, a, a great success in the way because so, you know, in fact, some people say uh, Dennis McKenna and uh, there is another Stephen Bayer who wrote this book, uh, Singing to the Plant. They said that this book was like the beginning, you know, of the globalization of ayahuasca because suddenly people started to see this and see what is this, and they were floating to to to, to Iquitos later on. And I'm 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 sorry because the you know the consequences have been good and bad at the same time. So I'm feeling responsible for that phenomenon in a way, you know. But it was, uh, anyway, so this is the way I did, you know, the painting, a, a description by Pablo, a series of footnotes. You know, this is this description of the painting and the, the footnotes. And, and, um, and so Pablo continued painting. I, I provided everything so that he could only dedicate himself to painting. Uh, he made this uh, Amazonian cosmos. Uh, uh, this painting, which I have in Helsinki, is going to be displayed in the uh, Quebranly Museum in Paris in November, uh, together with other painters, uh, all, uh, four painters, uh, Pablo and uh, and also other Amazon paint, uh, painters. This uh, the description of this painting was thirty five pages. Can you imagine? You know, it's like having Geronimus Bosch, uh, you know, the Garden of Delights, but being detailed the description of which you know what they are doing there. So. <clears throat> and I introduced Pablo to other artists, and uh, what happened? It was uh, it was a revolution, and you know, it, it, it was was created there. Okay, see, so, yeah. flying saucer again. And the thing is that uh, recently I heard a podcast by uh, Bob Forte um, about maps and this and that, and, and I have not seen him for many many years. I called him, and we started to talk. He told me that he had been with Mateo Arevalo, a cousin of Guillermo Arevalo, a favorite, a not so famous, <laughs> not a good reputation shaman. Uh, but he said that he told him that everything was, he came, a flying saucer came and gave him this, uh, this, this uh, ability. And then again and again, you know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, this thing about, you know, it, it's coming. And I think that it has to be done. I, I need to do something ab about that because, because, it is repeated again and again. I see it from various sources. How is it possible? You know, I have more stories to tell you about that, but no time for that. But anyway, so look, the, so the knowledge of Pablo Maringo about, about these things is just uh, was absolutely extraordinary. And then I started to organize exhibitions in Germany, in Japan, in the US, in Finland, 
um, traveled with him to many places, uh, especially in Finland, he became quite famous. Um, it was television and, uh, and, um, and um, newspaper interested. Uh, so I just go, you know, this is in Japan. There were several, I, I spent nine years of my life working with Pablo. And then parallel to this, um, uh, he ac uh, accepted uh, two kids to start painting, you know, with normal cardboard. And then I said, no, 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 uh, give them all the materials. And then I, I decided uh, June 15, 1988, let's create a school of painting. So, so created this, this uh, formally the, the school. And, and then the, it was just amazing, the, the results. The, the kids were painting landscape and, he, they, and they were using the same method that he was using because he has, a, Pablo has this eidetic a, a memory. He was able just to look at, at a sheet of paper. He said that what he did was to project an image on the, paint, on the paper. And once the image is clear, uh, clear, then he just put the colors. That's what he said. He just put the colors. And he was able even to work with three or four painters at the same time in order to save color. He knew that he was going to do red here and here and there and here. You know, no sketches. You know, it was just like that. And he was teaching this to the kids, you know, uh, organizing uh, uh, excursions to the forest. And they were doing this. And do you see the kids working uh, with, with their paintings? Okay, the, the school has to be grown because it came so many. But each of them was working on painting. And the idea was that the plants and the animals should be really, you know, uh, accurate. And amazing, you know. So, so we started, more and more kids came to the school. Uh, and, um, and I started to use some of the paintings for, for books, you know, cover of books. Uh, and um, and uh, <clears throat> at some point, this is the work of Anderson de Bernardi. The plants are accurate. <clears throat> the, the school grew more and more. They, they were able to do collective paintings. We organized a big exhibition in Oslo, the Children's Museum in Oslo. Um, and um, so at some point we had uh, tried to organize the, the problem. <laughs> I have to say that the problem is that suddenly it was, in a, I wanted to have an institution because I was getting also some donations and, and selling the paintings, 50% was to, for the school, the other for the kids. And it became quite complicated. Always money complicates things, you know. And then it was a, a, a director, but then I think it started to get more and more complicated as more students came and more money came to the to the school. We even have a, a, a computer. And um, we're talking about now, now 88, you know, 88, 89, you know. Uh, the school became famous in Pucallpa, uh, grew more. Uh, <laughs> and at some point, we had 300 students five ships and the idea was that everyone was a student and a teacher so you are always teaching those who knew less but learning from those who knew more there was the end totally free uh, of charge and the materials were free as well so these uh, exhibitions in many in place you know so uh, this is uh, and then i have an agent and and okay, in, 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 in the newspapers in, in Peru, they started to, you know, started to get attention for that, for that, and make calendars and so on. Uh, we even, I thought that I was naive in a way because it was growing beautifully, but also the problems. And I thought, my goodness, perhaps we can make, I, I was thinking to create a boat school, you know, in the, painted like a Yakumama, like a serpent going from different places along the Ucayali River and the Amazon and each little village will have a little ethnobotanical garden and a school of painting and so on. So I thought, and I think that you could have been possible, but the, the, pro, the internal problems, you know, became, uh, you know, impossible at the end. So, so this is, a, we sent kids to Tabatinga in Colombia and, and, and then some of the kids were in Helsinki painting in front of everybody, you know, by memory. Painting the, the, you know. And of course, uh, kids in Finland, they were amazed. Uh, I had a, we had a special exhibition in, the, in Oslo and the theme was disasters. So the, uh, um, uh, they, they, each kid got the idea that you, they have to paint a disaster that made different ones, like natural disasters, contamination, also political things, you know, there was cocaine in the war, and, you know, so all this was a, a massacre that took place in, in Pucallpa. And special cases, like once I was at the school and this man came 
uh, with a, a piece of cardboard painted like that. And I, I told Pablo, please, Pablo, don't teach him anything. Let him do whatever he wants. Give him just paper and everything. And he produces some extraordinary work. I was absolutely uh, amazed of, of the beauty uh, of his art. And in fact, in one article, one of the famous uh, uh, art uh, um, um, uh, critic said that we are going to hear about this man. Unfortunately, uh, um, he was killed, you know, he, he was uh, taking care of, uh, of a place with chickens and people came to steal the chickens. He was just killed, you know, this fantastic artist, you know. And then this is a peasant that came, also wanted to, to paint and look what she did, you know, this is what he, I have no idea. Is this in the heads of uh, Amazonian people? I mean, you know, so it's just absolutely amazing, you know. Uh, and, you know, you, and here you have the interculturality, you know, uh, the Amazon, the Amazon, the Amazon is not that remote place, it has been connected with the rest of the world, you know, it is, it was easier to get from Iquitos to New York than from Iquitos to Lima, you know, there have been all sorts of people going there, you know, including esoteric people, Russian Christians, everything, you know, they have been there. So you have, you see that in the, in the images, you know. And then uh, I was preparing this talk and I took this image and then again, a flying saucer here, you know. So, so what is this? I don't know, I, I have to check. All the kids started to do uh, ayahuasca visions. Pablo didn't like that. Um, and so some, I collected a few, a few of the paintings, but then, then Pablo decided, no, no, I don't want to have people here in my school taking ayahuasca and, and painting the visions. Um, and then he became very strict. He was kind of, at the end, he was kind of, uh, he was inclined to the Jehovah's Witness and became preaching the Bible and all that. So it, it, the, the thing became complicated, you know. Um, but look, some examples of, of this art, fantastic. <clears throat> and, and then another example, this kid, uh, De Verdardi, he was 18 when he uh, went to the school. And then he has become an extraordinary artist. You know, it's just like now he's traveling the world. You know, when I talk to him, he said, I'm going to Australia. I'm, I've been to, I'm going to Costa Rica. Well, I just have been, I'm going to have an exhibition in Amsterdam, blah, blah. And these are all kids who, you know, from the poorest families, you know, humble kids, you know. So some examples of, of his work. Uh, some of these paintings have been used in, in, in scientific publications because they are very accurate, you know, depicting various processes in the Amazon, and also his visionary art, uh, which is quite, quite extraordinary as well. I mean, you can, you have one of these paintings, you can spend hours and hours, and I, this one, I, I have it at home, and I always discover something, something new, you know. We created a, a botanical garden, which we have to abandon. It was too difficult in, in Pucallpa, but then we created a new botanical garden in Iquitos, which exists exist today, the Sachamama Botanical Garden. And, and uh, what we did, we sent 14 kids to the garden to work in the garden, and each of them will make a portrait of one plant. And, and so these are two examples. And this was the last exhibition in which I was involved in the Capital Children's Museum in Washington. It was very well attended and quite amazing. But as I said, I am not going to get much into it. The problems were immense, you know, because suddenly, you know, it's just more money, more money. What is worth the money? This and that, you know. And at the end, I, I realized that uh, even though I was working pro bono, the more I work, the worse it got, you know, the accusations and this and that, what is happening. So at the end, you know, um, and then I knew that some of the money was, uh, quite a lot of the money was going to Pablo's nephew, who was going buying stereos and this and that. And, you know, I said, I mean, very, very complicated. So at the end, I gave up. And so I presented my, you know, I renounced, you know, and I got this document and, and then I left. And then I forgot about that. At some point uh, at the conference in France, they invited me to, to see uh, um, uh, some artwork. And I found, you know, uh, the, the uh, sculptures uh, doing visionary work, you know, from the School of Painting, but doing the sculpture as well. So it's a whole new thing came out from, from that school that I didn't know existed. You know, really incredible pieces. And then I was invited, uh, I got a message from, from uh, uh, Scott Olsen, uh, who was, uh, was having a big exhibition in the Apatow Museum in Ocala, in, in Florida. 
uh, uh, he had been collecting uh, paintings from Pablo in the school. He had, some, he had something like 200 paintings, so it was a huge exhibition. You know? uh, and uh, Scott Wilson uh, was a, a retired professor in philosophy and religion, and he had written about many things. So, so, so suddenly I saw, my goodness, the, pro the project is not dead. It continued, you know, uh, the school uh, at the end uh, closed, you know, and now it's a sort of museum. But the kids, you know, continue doing work and now free from Pablo because there are no restrictions. They started to do visionary art. Then came the globalization of ayahuasca, tourists going to Iquitos, to Pucallpa, and buying the paintings. And so a whole new movement uh, was started. So here just... Uh, uh, from this exhibition 2017 or 18 in, in Ocala. Scott Dulce, Don Tito de la Rosa, famous musician, and uh, some examples of the art. Some of this is kind, kind of quiche, you know? I mean, I, you know, no, no, it's true. But, but anyway, people like to, to buy this, you know? And, and, and the money goes back in, into the Amazon. There's another resource, you know? So, so here are some examples. And, uh, and one idea, I think that this, this these paintings somehow they capture both the, 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 the nature of the, the Amazonian nature and the Amazonian imagination as well. It's a blending of the two things, you know, nature and imagination. So, some more examples. I could get, you know. <laughs> and even I found the Ayahuasca Jungle Vision, a, a, a color, coloring book, you know. <laughs> I mean, amazing, you know, for kids, you know. So, and okay. Then, uh, just last year, uh, a man from uh, Belgium uh, uh, got in touch with me and said, I'm organizing this uh, exhibition um, in, in a castle. And then, uh, uh, and then I learned that he had been doing huge exhibitions in Belgium, Holland, Hungary, Romania. And uh, it's, I think they had 23 exhibitions with ambassadors and all that. And the, the, the people, and he said that, you know, do the exhibitions and the paintings just go, sell everything and, you know, more. So he has now working with 40 of the former students organizing exhibitions. And the idea is nature, conservation, uh, you know, and so on. So uh, very beautiful. So. <clears throat> Uh, so he is Jean Paul. I have never met him face to face, you know. But uh, but uh, look, uh, 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 I mean, we've been talking through Skype, and I'm 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 delighted that somebody you know took the, the flag and is continuing. Now, he's a biologist and computer scientist, but then he went to Pucallpa and saw met several of the kids in Pucallpa. I mean, now there are kids any longer doing paintings, and they all talk about nature and the conservation of nature, which was the idea behind. I mean, the whole project was it was a. a, a, a the idea was uh, the conservation of nature uh, uh, projects uh, related to con to conservation or sustainability and so on, and um, so he started. He created this foundation, the Picaflor uh, Foundation, and so the project now continues. Other other uh, some of the students also creating uh, 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 school of paintings free or charge for the uh, most humble. So so it's it just. Fantastic, you know. So these are some of the, the kids at that time. Now they are men, and they are some of them are teachers, and and some of them traveling the world. So, so this this you know and nature and visions and 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 the animism. You know the idea of animism is absolutely there. You know, in David Copanao, he said that the spirits of the forest are the forest itself. So. And, and uh, I have been, you know, the last year very much uh, engaged into animism. And I think that that's, <laughs> that is the future, really, you know, and simply the recognition of mind in nature. And at the moment, you know, once you, rec you know, recognize that mind is everywhere, you know, then, then you deal with, with what is around us in a completely different way. And a lot of the depression and problems that we have simply because we have lost the connection. And I like, you know, uh, I met here in, in, in the last, last trip here, thanks to Johanna, who is here somewhere. I met Stephen Harding and I'm re reading his book, you know, and he talks about that. One such insight is that animistic perception is archetypal, ancient and primordial, that the human organism is inherently predisposed to see nature as alive and full of soul. And they will repress this fundamental mode of perception at the expense of our own health, and that of the natural world. And so 
the concept of biophilia. So we have all the possibility to understand the natural world in terms of personhood. That's what the, the, the many relational societies, they are, we, have, we are simply the human person, but the, this planet is full of persons. Um, and so we have the capacity to cultivate in this inward capacity that we can cultivate from the very beginning. This is my grandson. Okay. So, this is it. Thank you. What a complex story <laughs> about power, I just said a little bit. Okay. indigeneity, and Amazonians, and beauty, and art, and nature. Wow. <laughs> Question. Um, you kept referring to the UFOs, um, yes. and I want to ask a bit about that because something I've been kind of researching at the moment is psychedelic um, influences and imagery across massively separated cultures for a time and space, um, having shared like iconography. So the UFO is one example. I know Terence McKenna, when he first went to South America, sort of experienced those same UFOs um, in South America there. And you've got um, views of like, sort of serpentine um, animals with thousands of eyes, for example, in lots of cultures. Um, why do you think that is, I guess, is my question for Do you have any pet theories? On no, no, I don't. I mean, that is the thing. What is the ontology of the visions? Uh, so that, that is the big question. And, you know, then we get into the <laughs> philosophical problems about the nature of reality. So what is what is this? You know, is this different from that or not? Um, it's very difficult to say. You know, but it's very interesting that, by the way, visions and dreams. You know, this is the whole thing is 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 there. So I don't know. We can get into a speculation of all sorts. You know. Um, this is one one reality, but there are these other realities which which uh, they are not so um, you cannot measure, but you uh, you you cannot put numbers into that. But in in a certain way, they are cogita ex, uh, rex uh, extensa. You know, the car divided into rex cogitans, rex extensa. I think that there is something in between, which I call it the rex uh, magica or rex. Um, um, you know, something, you know, <laughs> uh, um, fantastica, because vision is something that, in theory, you could, you, you see, you see the extents, you know, you, you see that there is, but you cannot measure because you cannot touch it, you cannot, you know, but they see there is something in between. So, what is that? That is, I think that, that is one of the big mysteries. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I want to say, uh, I, I love talking. I was mesmerized by it, like the artworks and stuff like that. I just want to ask: when you showed the um, the children growing up, uh, most of them were male. Were there no women? Oh no, a lot of girls. A lot of girls. A lot of girls. I'm sorry. No, no, there are a lot of girls. You know, I was very con very concerned about that. No, no, no. We got a lot of girls. And some of the great artists now they are girls. You know, I don't know, if, just by chance. You know, but you know, yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, this was fascinating. I really love the style. Um, there's really beautiful paintings, and I was uh, I was very fascinated by the detail, especially in the natural world, kind of like mm -hmm. the leaves and everything. And you said that this was all kind of like from memory, right? Yes. Uh, what's the same? Was was this also the case with the kids, with the well, the students? Let's say. Well, there, there was the idea. Uh, Pablo always said. You, you don't copy from books or copy from nature. You go to the forest, you observe, you internalize the images, then you create in your mind, like with this tree, with this plant, with this bird, with that, but you create it in your mind. And then you protect it, uh, project it on the paper, which is quite amazing, you know, that they are able to do that. You know? I don't know. I mean, I have some slides that I deleted at the end. You know, the Amazon, you know, we think of the Amazon as a green world. The Amazon is also full of the human imagination. The Amazon is mostly mostly um, um, sedimental. You know? There are a few rocks, but wherever you find stones or rocks, you find paintings. And in fact, that is the work of uh, one of the professors here in Exeter University, Jose Iriarte, who has been working 
in, in Lindosa and with other paintings, you know, in the Amazon, the Colombian Amazon, you have a canvas 13 kilometers long, rocks full of paintings, 10 from at least 12,000 years ago being painted, you know, through the thousands of years. So, and the other thing is the body painting, Amazonian, you know, body painting, you know. And, and so, and so it, I don't know. So it seems that the painting, you know, the visionary world is very important for the Amazonian. I think probably for many other societies, I mean, of course, you know, but so they have a special gift, which we have lost in a way, you know, because of our, our education, our education, you know, we, you know, we don't observe you know, so much, you know, we don't memorize, we don't memorize images, colors, we don't memorize poems and, you know, a longer, when I was uh, in my school, you know, I still knew, knew some poems, you know, now nobody knows any poems, you know, some songs, you know, yeah, but, but, you know, so I don't know. I think that we are missing something. And that is the going back to nature. Yeah, please. And a little follow-up question, which may be a little bit heretical. Uh -huh. But have we had any sort of like attempts to try and uh, ed, uh, kind of like get uh, enroll some Western kids or some not Western necessarily, non-Amazonian, non-native Amazonian kids to see whether they could actually be taught to a degree to emulate the same skills and because uh, obviously the paintings are beautiful, the technique is amazing, but what I find really, really fascinating is the fact that they just do it, not even from memory, it's a combination of memory and imagination. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was yeah. wondering whether it could be well, taught. I think to... so. I, I, yeah, I, I think that it would be possible. In fact, my, one of my ideas was to send teachers, you know, my son teachers to schools, you know, school anywhere, you know. And in fact, now with Jean Paul Wicks, this Jevelian, he wrote to me that he wants me to get involved into some kind of project in the Brazilian Cerrado, which is high up, with kids, not non Amazonian, completely different kids, to create a school there and to see if it is possible, you know, to teach this kind of methods and so. So we'll see. Yeah. Please. Uh, sorry. Well, um, I was just wondering if you've ever tried, like, learning the painting style yourself or just having it. <laughs> Did you, no, you, I, you know, it's it, it, terrible. No, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, I have been seeing all these things, but always busy doing this, you know. No, no, uh, I know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tried that, but I didn't like the result. But, 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 I, you know, it's a question of dedication, of time. You know, this, I don't have it. I've not had it, you know, in all these years. Too busy to things, you know. It's a completely different space, you know, that, that I don't have. You know? Um, yeah, you shared a lot of books, but if you, would, you shared a lot of books up there of the art. But is there one that you would go to? So, in other words, if you wanted to sort of buy a book and it was easily available, but was also a great example of this art, which well, I mean, the, the first book, the Ayahuasca Vision book, a bit is out of uh, print. Uh, I learned, but they said it's coming out in two months again. You know, I have another story with the that. Richard Grossing, and by the way, that is the problem. You know, the problem is that once you have success, success, then you start to deal with dealers, with galleries, with museums, and everybody wants a cut, and the kids want more money, and blah, 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 and then you get into terrible mess, terrible mess. You know, in the one of the last exhibitions that I organized. So, so there was a price, but then the dealer wanted to have a cut. So we have to put higher. The museum wanted to have a cut. You know. So in the end, you know, you have to put the high prices. We didn't sell, you know. My idea with this kind of art, which is not a great art, is <laughs> available. For, you know, anybody can afford it. You know, you can have a, 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 a one of the students kit for one hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. Your home is beautiful, you know. Doesn't need to be in museums, you know. It can be. So that was the idea. So why is it not great art? I mean, maybe some of it is and some of it isn't, right? Well, it is not <laughs> uh, fashionable. Uh, I don't know. It's well, beautiful. Obviously is if people are prepared to pay a lot of money and make exhibitions everywhere. So, so well, I'm, I'm looking at this from this question of sort of. To, you talk about Amazonians. You talk about these kids. Yeah. Um, and you said humble more than once. So, so an opportunity, but this is obviously not an opportunity to become a world, become a world famous painter for one of the thousands that have been trained there. So the idea is that, so, so if, you, if you think through the economy of this 
and the sort of vision that is in it. To which degree do you think you, there is a certain Orientalism in it that is sort of idealizing a particular way of life in which you sort of introduce a principle of sort of them being paid for their work? No, no, they're all paid by their work. As soon as the capitalist machinery kicks in because it is successful, you are sort of uncomfortable with it. So can I just ask how you feel about this? No, no. Uh, uh, Okay. Um, I I mean, uh, of course, some of the kids get big money, you know. I say kids, you know, because for me, there are always kids in my mind. That they are, now they are 50 years old, you know, <laughs> some of them, you know. So, so, and they get into galleries and all this, and they make good money, yeah, which is good, fantastic. Some of, I mean, they are gifted people, but the Bernardi is a fantastic painter, absolutely, you know, from, and many, and some others, you know. But that is, these are the, 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 the kids that make it in the big world. But there are many others who can do things like it will be like, like handicraft of some sort, you know. Uh, when, once you see, you know, all these paintings, you see that, in a way, I say, kitsch, you know, they, they repeat it again and again, the sunset, the jaguar, the snake, all the blah, blah, blah. Okay, you see it again and again. But they are beautiful enough that you can get them instead of getting a souvenir, you know, you get the painting like that. And, and I, I, when I was um, selling the paintings, I was saying, you take a little piece of the rainforest with you. In your, in your home without touching a leaf, you know? So you and the kids are learning about it. But anyway, I don't know if I answered your, your question. I think that there are... No, so do you think complex. there is a fashion of romanticizing these kind of imageries? You said, it is, you said yourself that it sort of brought the ayahuasca visions into the West in a way that sort of made them very appealing. Yes. And yeah. that you now find this problematic. So. I find it problematic because then comes... The whole apparatus, I mean, in Iquitos, uh, one of the students now is a doctor, uh, uh, he said that there were around Iquitos about 150 centers, you know, ayahuasca retreats. Most of them um, led by Americans who pay so shamans who, who do the sessions and, you know, and so and in the end, you know, and then they are depleting the, from, from the ayahuasca, the area. Very difficult to get any ayahuasca around Iquitos because all these centers, you know. So that is the, the bad thing about that because then, then ayahuasca belong, is not any longer a sacred plant teacher, but just a commodity, you know, which is made for making money and all that, you know. So that is... But on the other hand, there are people who really learn something from the plant, do, you know, help other people, do healing centers, you know. I mean, there's like double edge, you know, as, as, as everything, you know, it's just you have both things, yeah. If you were to um, give ayahuasca to, say, some kids in a poor part of London or something like in very in some poor part of London or some Western, yeah. perhaps deprived area, would you still anticipate seeing some nature? In the- no, no, no. Well, for the first, I will never give uh, ayahuasca to the kids, and the yeah. kids are not taking ayahuasca. You keep calling them. Uh, well, some of them they, they are you not. Know, they are taking, and you know, but but many of these kids are not taking anything. They are just learning how to paint. They are learning how to visualize, to internalize, to paint. You know. But of those who did, but I mean, of those who who did, I don't think that ayahuasca will teach you how to. Although uh, Maringo said that he learned it, you know, in some other uh, sculptures that I, in my vision, I learned how to carve and all that, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, perhaps some of them, perhaps not. I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. Sorry. Yeah. Can we uh, learn from or bring from? An, can we learn from or bring an animist worldview? As you are context of this mechanized, um, demystified, Eurocentric world that we're, we're in right now. Absolutely. Well, that's the idea. Well, we are live in a way. We live in a in an animistic society, but the wrong one, because companies are people. You know, McDonald's and Coca Cola and these these are people. They are treated, you know, legally as people. What a mistake, you know, and the others, the real people are not people. You know? So, so, 
So we need to shift, you know, into some kind of animistic society. That I think that that is the only way out, really. I mean, you know, yeah. because at the moment you 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 re realize that all the tree, you know, these are people. These are people, you know. They have rights, um, and then, then, and then the idea that you are one people among many other people. Then comes the idea of respect, of relationship, of uh, you know, it's a completely different web view. Now I'm very worried, you know, that our society is more and more surrounded by objects, not sub subjects. You know, not any longer subject. You know, it's objects. You know? So there's the problem. Yeah. Um, mentioning like the society being surrounded by objects and animism, um, I'm not too like sure about the definition of animism. Is it does it not go as far as something like panpsychism, insofar as like everything organic and living, or what we might commonly describe as living, has a spirit or sentience? But things like rocks or planets or the universe or yeah. electrons, depending on Peter must be uh, listen to this, you know, <laughs> and here's the panpsychism. You know. I think, you know, um, well, I mean, for me, animism, it's easier for us to see, you know, because it's plants and animals, okay? You can go to lakes, mountains, you know, in the you know, mountains, all that. Now, if you go down in molecules and this, this, this table, you know, and that, then becomes a little bit, you know, we become detached emotionally from that. And for me, the thing with panpsychism is a little bit too abstract, you know, it's too big, you know, maybe it's true, you know, but, you know, I mean, down to the, you know, but I, I, in a way, I'm pragmatic in a way that we need something now, here, you know, which can really make people make choice, <coughs> choices and change change life, change behavior and so on. So, so do you view yeah. it as like an accessible version of hands -like Yeah, perhaps in a way, you know, you know, yes, yes, I mean, the, the, yeah, and then of course you know, we can go to, into into you know feel, you know the the Western tradition because there is a Western tradition as well there all the time you know which like which has been suppressed in a way we think of Goethe and we think of William James and with a white head and all. there is a tradition there you know which we don't pay attention Merleau-Ponty and so on. So one of the things we perhaps you, the philosophers of psychedelics, try to bring, you know, the the the, the animistic uh, traditional societies in contact with those ideas they are in the Western world, you know, and you know, and see how they blend and how they can help all of us to get out of this terrible situation in which we are, because we are in the, we are in crisis. I mean, there's no deny, you know, we are in crisis. So. Hmm? That's it. <laughs> I've got more questions if no one else. Okay, does. please. <laughs> um, sorry to go back to that, but you when you were talking previously about the um like the UFOs or any of your experiences existing in this third kind of mystical uh realm, where does that fit in with animism? Yeah, if okay. That makes, well, how does yeah, that there is again, you know, the world of, of organism and the world of culture and imagination, you know. Now, with, with the flying sauces and all that, for me, it's difficult. Okay, one thing, as I said, the Amazon has been open, you know. So there have been magazines, there have been, you know, everything has gone there, you know. People have seen magazines with, you know, flying sauces and this and that, you know I mean? It, it, is, it is in the Amazon. I don't know to what extent those flying sauces are the result of culture coming in into the Amazon. Or if there is something else, you know, something else, but we can, you know, this big interrogation, you know, which, you know, that, you know, there's the big question. Are we alone <laughs> again? Are we, I mean, are we interpenetrated by all the dimensions? Is there intelligence out there? How they, if they are, how they present ourselves, you know, this, you know, then we come to the big mysteries and, and we know so little about it. So are there not any of the UFO depictions on the like 10,000 year old rocks or do we find them on there? Well? Um, not like that. Not How like do that, you yeah. know it's a UFO? I mean, it couldn't be something else. I guess. Like a beautiful bowl with a little 
I can't be too clear. Just a little Pandora's box, nicely decorated. Why is it a UFO? Well, Just I mean, I guess you'd still ask why the balls there. We put labels, you know, to that, you know, of course. Yeah, uh, it might just be I, not a UFO. I, I can tell a story, you know, a little story since we have time, and apparently. And when I was doing the diet, you know, in order to do, learn with these things, you have to do a diet, you know, a very strict diet. And I was a month with the Shipibo doing the diet. We took 13 times ayahuasca and almost no food, you know, <laughs> really tough. And then, and then, and then, okay, after one month there, he sang some song, you know, to protect me because I was going back to the world, you know. So uh, uh, I was in, in Santa Rosa de Pirococha. And in order to get out from that village, you have to wait until a boat will come by, you know. I mean, there are, and there are no sketches, you know. You are by the river and, and waiting, and I have to wait one and a half days until suddenly there was a boat, and then you take something, and you, you know, so, so they see you, ah, and, and the boat comes, you know, and then I, I, I went on board. And it was one and a half days to get to Santa Rosa and the Pinocchio to Pucalpa. And I was in my hammock, you know. Usually you travel in a hammock. And I was sleeping, and somebody... Came, you know, the captain is, wants to talk to you. Okay, so I went out and I talked to him. He said, look at that. And it was big light, you know, no color. It was just white light, about one third of the full moon up there. And we're looking at, looking at it and gradually, very gradually, it moved upwards, you know, and disappeared. I mean, disappeared there. But not fast, you know, it was slowly, slowly. And he was telling me stories in the meantime. He was telling, oh, I see many of them, you know, there all the time. They, they come here. Once he said there was a big thing in front in the, in the river. And I have to stop the, the boat because, you know, I was afraid that I was going to, you know. And sometimes they disappear under the water and they go here. So the, for him, that was normal. Okay. One year later, <clears throat> I, I, I said, uh, I have to meet this guy and tell me more. And I went with the video camera and found the boat, but the captain was not working there any longer. I didn't know where he was working. And then before leaving, I went down to the machine and there were three or four people working with the cleaning the, the engine with my camera. And then I said, okay, well, I was about to go. I said, have any of you have seen UFOs on you know, blah blah? All of them. Yeah, yeah, yes, blah, blah, blah. So I had a long thing, you know, with them. Apparently, it is normal. And now I know that, you know that, uh, that several shamans claim that they, you know, they learn from them, they got some energy from them, their healing powers are from something, you know. So I don't know, I don't know. So <laughs> Go and find out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was just interested. Why was he like Pablo Amarino against the kids and doing ayahuasca art? Okay, uh, that's very complex. You know. Okay, for the first, he when I met him for seven years, he had never taken ayahuasca. He was afraid to take ayahuasca. And he was very afraid, you know. Once we were in Helsinki and I was taking photographic uh, slides in the, in the cellar of, uh, uh, of the, my school in Finland. And I had to switch off all the lights. We were in the cellar and all the lights, total darkness because of, you know, to be able to take out the negative. He immediately started to scream. Put the lights on, put the lights on, you know. So I had to quickly, you know, he was afraid. He was very much afraid. And so, because he said that when you get into these spaces, it is related with the idea of illness in the Amazon. Illness is always caused by an agent, animated agent, either spirit, another shaman, or somebody, you know, but it is like that. So he said that, in, that he understood that in order to, be, um, to continue being a shaman, he had to fight a certain sorcerer from which by, you know, he had taken the song, very complex, you know, because there's the idea of stealing songs and all that, all songs, which are the vehicle of healing, uh, uh, going without you, you wanted, coming to you and you know the songs and the other one loses the songs and he will be, take revenge and go after you and all that. So, Extremely complex. So, so Pablo said no. 
And then he was very much into Johannes' witness uh, and Jehovah's witness and all that. And, you know, so I said, no, 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 kids, you know, they should not take ayahuasca, you know. And he could see, you know, if somebody had taken ayahuasca, he said, you have taken ayahuasca because you could, he could see, you know, you can see, you know, in the face, you know, too happy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, we actually have to leave the room. Are there more questions? So we have maybe time for one more, but then we really have to leave. Okay, so we leave. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>